All right, so now we're going to take a look at a few more models that we want to consider um, for which we can develop the differential equation for. The first model is going to be that of mixtures. Now, what I'm talking about again with a mixture is we've got um, basically a tank. I'll draw this to the best of my ability with this little pen here. And you've got flowing in to the tank an input valve, something coming in, and you've got an outflow valve, something going out. Okay, And the solution coming in has something dissolved in it, something like a salt mixture or some other contaminant, pollutant, whatever you want to model. Um, and so what we're going to use as our variable is going to be the amount of whatever the contaminant is or whatever the element within the mixture would be. Let's, let's just for... Um, consideration let's let's talk about a brine a salt mixture coming in and so we're going to model the amount of salt at time t that is in this tank okay now you're going to have some parameters such as how fast is the water coming in what's the concentration of what's coming in the volume of the tank how things are going out but our assumption is basically going to be that we want to um, assume the rate of change of salt is the difference between the rate in and the rate out. So how, whatever rate it's coming in, that is how many, say, pounds per gallon is coming in, is going to be subtracted um, by the amount of salt as its rate is going out. So dA dt, the rate of change of the amount of salt, would be the input rate minus the output rate, okay, which another way for me to denote that is to be Rn minus R out, okay. Now note that the rate at which these things move is going to be equal to whatever the concentration is of the solution, so the concentration of the fluid coming in, um, that is how many, um, say, for example, pounds per gallon, um, times whatever the flow is. So if you have, for example, um, so many gallons flowing in per minute, then the rate is going to actually be how many pounds of salt are coming in every minute, right? If you multiply those two together, the gallons cancel, and you've got pounds per minute coming in. Okay, so let, let's look at a specific example and see how we derive the differential equation. We have some certain parameters involved. So let, let's consider the case where we have coming in. Oh, where's my pen? Uh, we have coming in three gallons per minute. Uh, let's draw a picture. I'll grab this pen here. Let's take a. Oops, draw this down. So what we've got is coming in to the tank. We have three gallons per minute, and we know that there is a brine concentration of two um, pounds per gallon. The other thing we've got is that the outflow of this thing, that is what's coming out from the tank, is at a rate of three gallons per minute. Now we've chosen that because we want the volume to stay steady, steady, which the volume is going to be 300 gallons. Okay, so remember that the differential equation dA dt is equal to the rate in minus the rate out. Now what is the rate in? Rate in is going to be the concentration in, which is 2 pounds per gallon times the flow, which is two or sorry, three gallons per minute, or six pounds per minute. The rate out is going to be um, what the concentration is. Now we got a dilemma there. We don't have a concentration measure, right? We only have how fast it's going, which is three gallons every minute. That's the flow. So what is the concentration of the salt mixture inside here. We know coming in it's three gallons per minute, but this mixture in here, we don't know what it is. 
because we don't know how much salt is in there except to say that we know that the amount at any time t is my dependent variable. Now concentration is just how much salt divided by how much liquid. That would be the concentration. So in our case, since we don't know what the amount of salt is, we're going to just include it as the variable a and then divide it by the volume. So that is how many pounds per gallon is going to be in there. So that cancels and leaves us with a over 100, which means then that my differential equation dA dt would look like 6 minus a over 100. Or if I rearrange this into a more linear form, just move the a over 100 on the other side, I have dA dt is equal to, not equal to, sorry, is uh, added to 1 over 100 times a is equal to 6, which is a nice linear form for our differential equation. Now on top of that, if in fact we know that the um, initial concentration of the tank is one pound per gallon, then we can set up our initial value problem. Remember our dish initial value problem would have the differential equation, which we just derived using our assumption, together with an initial condition. What is the starting amount of salt? How much salt is there at time zero? Now it's not one because one tells me concentration a represents amount of salt. So if there's one pound per gallon and at any time we always have 300 gallons, then it's actually going to be one pound per gallon times 300 gallons or 300 is our initial condition. So that's what our initial value problem looks like for this mixture. Okay, now we're going to talk about falling bodies. Now, I don't necessarily mean the kind of bodies that you have whenever <laughs> you're talking human bodies, even though my clip art there kind of indicates that that's what I was referring to. But the falling body we're going to be talking about is when we have an object some distance above the ground. So we start uh, with an object here, and then it's going to be some height above the ground down here. All right, so let's say, for example, we start with some initial height of, um, we'll call it uh, S0, since we're going to use the variable S of T to represent the um, height of the object above the ground at some time T. Okay, so the assumptions that we're going to use in this case are going to be our, our classical uh, Newtonian physics. Uh, where uh, we're going to use Newton's um, three laws to model the motion of this particular uh, object. So uh, think about Newton's first law. Newton's first law is most commonly interpreted as the law that says that an object at rest tends to stay at rest or an object in motion tends to stay in motion. But an alternative um, interpretation, equivalent interpretation, is that the force acting on a system is the sum of all the individual forces. So the resultant force is the sum of the individual forces. So if an object is moving and all the forces sum to zero, or if object is still and all the forces sum to zero, then it won't change its state. So we're going to talk about the sum of all of these forces. Uh, there is also Newton's um, second law. Uh, Newton's second law is the law that says um, that the force acting on an object is proportional to acceleration. So uh, F is equal to MA is the formula we typically use to represent that. Now recall, acceleration in this context means the second derivative of our motion function, or our height function, I should say. So the second derivative of S with respect to T is our acceleration. All right, um, so if we, we consider this system, we have only one force acting on it. Our assumption is gravity is that force. Um, gravity is a constant force, so um, your difference equation is going to be m times acceleration is equal to, and now since the force is acting downward, we're going to have a, a mg, but it's going to be negative 
because again, it's, it's going down and we're assuming positive is the up direction. Now we can uh, divide out the m's and we have our differential equation, second derivative of s with respect to t is equal then to negative g. If we want to consider our uh, initial value problem, then s of zero is going to be whatever initial height is, which we've called s zero. But because it's a second order system, we need a second initial condition. So the second uh, initial condition is s prime at zero, which we talked about in class, represents the initial velocity of that particular uh, object. So we can set up our initial value problem to look like that. Now this assumes that the only force acting on the system is in fact the, uh, the gravity, right? So if we want to consider what happens if there are additional forces, we have to go and consider uh, perhaps say what air resistance does. So let's take a look at that. So we, we have the same variables in this problem. We have the same scenario, except there is the force of gravity acting downwards, proportional to the mass. And there is an additional force acting in the opposite direction. Now, what is that force? That's what we're going to call air resistance. Now, there are a number of ways for us to model air resistance. And in fact, we'll talk more in detail about better uh, models. But our first assumption might be a simple approach is saying, that if the body is falling, the faster it's falling, the more air resistance you have. The faster you ride on a bicycle, the harder the wind pushes against you. The faster you're falling through the air, the harder the air is pushing back up against you. So we're going to assume that the air resistance is a force that's in the opposite direction and it is proportional to velocity. In other words, air resistance we might write as proportional to velocity. Now what's velocity? Velocity is ds dt. Ha. So going back to um, force is equal to mass times acceleration, what we now have is mass times the acceleration of our object is equal to the sum of all of the forces involved. That's Newton's first law. So the sum of all the forces, you first got gravity, which is negative mg. And now you've got a force acting in the other direction. So if gravity is acting down, that's negative in the positive direction. So plus k times the velocity, uh, k being, oh sorry, k times the velocity because it's proportional to ds dt. Um, now, is the sign correct? That's what you want to evaluate. Is the force acting in the correct direction? So let's say my ds dt is my velocity. So if the velocity is going down, I want the force acting in the opposite direction. Okay. So ds dt, if it's going down, is negative. I want the whole force to be positive. So actually, I have this sign wrong. That should say minus k. Now, do you understand why well, that has to be um, negative? Because if ds dt is, is the velocity and your velocity is going down, then the air resistance is going to be going in the positive direction. So the whole term has to be positive. So you've got to put a negative k out front if you want k to be positive. On the other hand, if the velocity was going upward, so that is a positive number, then you have that you need the whole term to be, in fact, negative because you want the air resistance to be acting in the opposite direction, so it's down. Okay. We can also divide out the m's here, um, and to put this in linear form, we're going to move this term to the other side, so you actually have the second derivative of s with respect to t <coughs> is uh, plus k ds dt equals negative g. Differential equation model for falling bodies, this time incorporating air resistance. Now, ultimately, our goal will be, can we find the actual S? We haven't talked about solution techniques yet, so that's what we're going to introduce in Chapter 2. All right, now we're going to build more sophisticated models as the semester goes on and be able to answer more questions. And in fact, what's really more interesting about this whole process is once we're able to actually find the solution, we want to be able to find the solution to 
the differential equation. Then we can graph it. We can see what's going to happen. We can use it to answer questions. That's what we want. But setting up the model, sometimes that's a difficult step. So that's why we want to be sure and cover it here. Last thing I want to uh, speak about is just some terminology. Everything that we've done in this section, section 1.3, about solving or setting up models has been using what are called dynamical systems. Now, all a dynamical system is, is some kind of system, a set of objects, a set of forces, a set of mathematical principles, where you're basically studying something that changes or evolves with the flow of time. So your solutions are going to be like x of t, y of t. Those are all your dependent variables. But within a dynamical system, in this terminology, we refer to those as state variables. It is the state of your system at any time t. So the state, um, or sorry, not the state, the value of the system is called the state of that entire system. Sorry, kind of bungled that. Let me say it one more time. The state of the system is the value of all the state variables at any given time t. So when you talk about a falling body, we only had one dependent variable. That was the height. So the state of the system would be what the height is when you give me a particular time. The initial value problem, if we have the solution of that, that's called the response of the system. So if you had dA, dt, this is our um, population model. If it's... If it's dA dt is equal to ka and a of t naught is equal to a naught, a would be called the state variable. The solution, which turns out to be this guy here, is called the response of the system. And not all systems are dynamic. Some systems, if they don't depend on time, are going to be referred to as static systems. But that's just some terminology that we use in the context of models that depend on time. All right, so that's the end of our modeling section. Good luck on the homework. It's all posted in Blackboard. Um, we'll see you next time.